the hat is at you. Thank you very much, Ali, yeah. for this introduction. So I'm going to share the screen. Okay, hope you can see the screen in full mode now. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, everyone, in case you are here in Europe. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Arnau Folk, and I am a professor now uh, at the Geoscience Barcelona, which belongs to the Spanish National Research Council. But I also have a double affiliation, so I am also based at the, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Today is about volcanoes, and I'm going to start with uh, this series of two talks on, on the data simulation of volcanic clouds. This is the plan for today. This morning, there are these two. two 45 minutes talk with, with a break of 10 minutes. And then uh, in the af in, uh, after lunch or in the afternoon, we, we're gonna have uh, another two talks on, on lava dynamics. Uh, I am very sorry, I know I should ah. interrupt you, but yesterday I gave this talk because ah. to replacing the uh, Vasily Titov who cannot, couldn't make. And today ah. will be Vasily Titov on, <laughs> instead of me, sorry. Okay, so I didn't know because I was in the field until yesterday, so I... Yes, absolutely. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. No problem. <laughs> okay. So this is the, the, the contents of the two talks. Uh, I think it's worth to do a, a first long introduction on, on, on volcanic clouds first to see, I guess that some of you will maybe not have a strong background on, on volcanology and on volcanic clouds. So I think it's worth to spend uh, some time uh, showing what are volcanic clouds and how do we model them and how do we forecast uh, the trajectories and the evolution of volcanic clouds. And also, how are the settings of uh, operational models and which is the role that uh, data simulation is playing nowadays on, on, on all these setups. Uh, we will also see a few slides on the uh, different observation mechanisms that, that we have for volcanic clouds. In particular, I will focus on satellite, on satellite uh, devices, let's say, because this is the most, uh, the most used, but we also will see other. I think that this will take me around these 45 minutes, so that's probably part one of, 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 of the two talks. And then in the second block, we will go straight to the point and see the different data simulation strategies. And in particular, we will see what uh, the community has developed in the, in the last uh, decade, uh, which are essentially three different strategies, data insertion, the inversion of the source term, and then a more, let's say, uh, standard ensemble-based sequential data simulation. And then I, I will finish with the conclusion. So let's just start with this uh, introduction, and, and I will try to explain you briefly what are volcanic clouds. Uh, the first thing we have to know is that uh, volcanic clouds are formed during explosive volcanism, and the explosive volcanism is characterized by the fragmentation of magma. So we have this situation here. Typically, during an eruption, we have a, a deep reservoir or a shallow reservoir which contains magma. Magma is a silicate melt that has also uh, volatiles dissolved. And an important point is that the, the solubility of these volatiles in, in, in the magma depends on pressure. So in the reservoir, pressures are high and we can, uh, the, the volatiles are dissolved. When we have an eruption and this magma starts to ascend through a dike or through a conduit towards the surface, it may reach a point that we call the exolution surface in which uh, this uh, melt gets saturated and gas bubbles start to form. This is a phenomenon similar to what happened when we open and we depressurize a champagne bottle, right? We just uh, decrease the pressure that uh, saturates uh, the volatiles and it produces the exolution of, of gases. During the ascent, uh, this uh, mixture of uh, magma with uh, uh, gas bubbles reaches uh, levels, uh, shallower levels where the pressure is less and less, and these bubbles uh, expand and grow, and grow up to a level with uh, a phenomenon which is called magma fragmentation of course, and this happens at this fragmentation level. And this is a dramatic change because then when the magma fragments, it converts into, uh, uh, let's say, a gas with uh, Mm, pyroclasts uh, of different sizes. No? Uh, this process of magma fragmentation uh, can produce um, what the geologists call pyroclasts, which are essentially uh, this magma broken, let's say, of many different sizes. And they are globally known, uh, regardless of the size, they are globally known as uh, volcanic tephra. 
but uh, we have names for these particles depending on the size. Uh, larger particles are named or are called volcanic bombs. And by definition, they are more than 6.4 uh, centimeters, so 64 millimeters in size and diameter. Then the, the particles that are larger than two millimeters are named as lapilli. And finally, the finest component of this uh, resulting from this fragmentation is what we call volcanic ash. And volcanic ash are all the particles that are less than two millimeters in size. Uh, then when all this material, essentially this is gas with all these particles uh, dispersed, uh, reach the bend, they form an eruption, an eruption column or a volcanic plume. And this is how it looked like. So these columns are essentially when, when they are emitted in the atmosphere, uh, as I said, a mixture of uh, gases and tephra, and they, and they can inject a huge, huge amounts of, of materials to the atmosphere uh, at high velocity. At the, the basal region, uh, this is a momentum driven. So there is an excess of momentum. So the ascent of this mixture is essentially driven by, by, by the excess of momentum. But then, uh, because this is mixture is very hot, it's much hotter than the surrounding air, it starts to entrain air and it hits the air. And this uh, produces all this uh, convection uh, mechanism, this what we call the convection region that produces the ascent of all this mixture up to uh, an neutral buoyancy level in the atmosphere. That essentially depends on of the energy. The most energetic uh, eruptions, they can uh, put this material up to many kilometers in the atmosphere, but essentially depends on, on the energy that is, is available. But in any case, uh, a level or, or situation is reached when all this material that forms the, the eruption column reaches a neutral buoyancy level. And there, the, the winds at hay start to, let's say, uh, advect all this material and form what we call the volcanic cloud. So essentially, I want to make this distinction between what we call the column, which is this uh, uh, ascending part with uh, vertical velocity, and the volcanic cloud which is driven by passive transport, okay? So this is passive, passively transport by, by winds and is a mixture of uh, entrained air with volcanic gases and particles uh, dispersed. So when, when these particles uh, and gases are injected, uh, we know that they, they, they can be transported very, very large uh, distance before the, these particles settle on the ground. And they are passively driven by several physical mechanisms. Uh, the most dominant is uh, the advection by wind, but we also have uh, turbulent atmospheric uh, diffusion. And of course, because these particles have a certain size, they do settle down, and we have also a particle sedimentation. And all in all, uh, depending on the injection height and on the wind speed, uh, these clouds can travel from 100 to 1,000 of kilometers from, from the volcanic source. No? We can see here a couple of, of images on how these clouds look like in the visible. Uh, so these are satellite images from, from, from the Cordon Cauye and one of the uh, eruptions of Mount Etna in Sicily. Uh, an important point is that the settling velocity is very, very much dependent on the, on the particle size. So, as I said, we have particles uh, of uh, different sizes, bombs and blocks uh, with size larger than 64 millimeters. They typically have uh, falling velocities of the order of around 100 meters per second. It means that uh, typically the resonance time of these larger particles in the atmosphere is very low, so a few seconds. And as a result, they fall out very, very close to the volcano. So typically, they don't reach large distances. They fall out just with a ballistic component at a few kilometers from, from the volcano. The other types of particles, so lapilli, coast ash, and fine ash, they have, uh, this is order of magnitude, no? But uh, velocity, settling velocity is in the range of 10 meters per second in the case of, of the lapilli, or of the order of one meter per second in the case of coast ash, or even centimetric uh, velocities in the case of, of fine ice, no? And as a result, again, here, the residence time is very, very changing. For lapilli, typically, it stays in the atmosphere of minutes. It means that it reaches in medium, uh, medial distances, tens of kilometers, typically. Whereas the coarse ice and the fine ice, they can travel long, long distances, okay? From 100 to thousands of kilometers. Normally, the fine material can even reach 
uh, several thousands of kilometers. This has implications because we have to distinguish uh, between what we call the proximal clouds, which are the, the, the cloud very, very close to the band, uh, which are more concentrated. Um, the cloud in the proximal locations has all these particles within. But as I said, the coarser particles fall, fall very, very soon, producing volcanic fallout, whereas the finer particle can travel larger distances. Okay, so. If we look at the cloud at the very far away from the source, what we will see in this distal cloud is that they are more, more much more dilute. They are not concentrated, and they carry on uh, essentially micrometric size particles. Whereas the proximal clouds, they are much more concentrated. They are optically thick, and they carry uh, particles of all of all sizes. Uh, an important thing is that the, the, apart from this passive transfer by wind advection and particle sedimentation and uh, turbulent diffusion, some other phenomena may also occur within a volcanic cloud. And probably one of the, of the most relevant is the aggregation of particles. This is a phenomenon that, that occurs uh, and depends on, on, on many parameters. And it's a phenomenon by which the, the finite particles can aggregate and form much larger size uh, particles. And this is essentially is something that is, uh, let's say, enhanced uh, by the presence of water that acts as a binding mechanism for these uh, particles. The water, uh, water or ice coating allows these particles to, to stick and to form much larger particles. These aggregates that, for example, you can see here a microscope, uh, same uh, image. Uh, how these aggregates look like. No? So it's, for example, this aggregate is composed by thousands of uh, small ash particles, and they have half millimetric size. Obviously, these aggregates, they fall, fall the settling velocity of the aggregate is much, much larger because they, they have a much larger size. And it means that when aggregation occurs uh, in, in the volcanic cloud, it uh, triggers or it causes a premature removal of mass, okay? Because the aggregates form, so they settle down much, much faster. And uh, we have clouds that are deple depleted in, in fine uh, material. It is important to put aggregation in the models, but one of the problems that we have nowadays is that we still don't have a full comprehensive aggregation model. This is very difficult to model. We know how to do it, uh, we know that we have to solve the so-called Smolachowski equation, but the problem is that doing this with all the particle size and all the degrees of freedom that we have here is really hard from the computational point of view. It is very, very expensive, very, very expensive. And we have to do some assumptions that uh, in most of the cases work, but in some cases they, they do not work so well. Uh, when we have the fallout of, of, the, of the material, we have a a lot of, of impacts on the ground. No? I just put here some pictures of what happened when all these materials fall down on the ground and we have impacts on infrastructures. For example, what you see here on the top uh, left is a picture of uh, a town in Argentina close to the Chaitén volcano in Chile. And of course, uh, if the, the ash fallout is substantial, uh, we can have even collapse of the roofs of the roof of the houses or the infrastructures because it's, it's quite heavy particularly if it if it rains after the fallout ash uh, can become quite heavy and if you don't clean it uh, it, it can cause uh, roof collapse uh, it produces also the fallout impacts on of course on, on, on agriculture on, on livestock uh, because uh, ash particles they carry uh, they are fluid rich and when the animals uh, eat the grass that has been that has some so much, uh, it can produce uh, fluorosis to the animals. Apart from, uh, uh, let's say, abrasion of the tooth and uh, many other irritation of eyes, etc. Uh, of course, it causes also impacts on the transportation network. For example, on the on the roads, uh, as is very slippery, so you cannot drive if uh, you have to clean the roads, uh, etc. So. But uh, probably the most, um, uh, let's say, the highest impact is, is on, on air navigation, okay? Uh, and on air, on air quality as well. So we have a lot of impact on civil aviation. And, and the main reason for that, there are two reasons. One is that the, the ash particles, uh, they are very angular and in shape and very abrasive. Again, this is a, a microscope, electronic microscope uh, image 
of a typical ash particle, just for reference, this is 30 micron size. And as you can see, they are far from spherical. They are very, they have a lot of holes, pores, and they are very abrasive, no? And you can imagine what happens when we have a cloud with these particles suspended and an airplane that is traveling at, let's say, I don't know, 900 kilometers per hour impacts when with these particles, no? It uh, produces a lot of uh, abrasion on many components of the aircraft, on, on the windscreens, also on the, on the blades of the turbine, it produces uh, uh, erosion, uh, affects the fuselage of the aircrafts, uh, the navigation instruments. If there is also uh, some volcanic gases, for example, uh, sulfur dioxide, it also produces a lot of uh, corrosion on the, metallical, on the metallic components of the airplane, etc. But probably apart from that, which is already, uh, all these are problems, we also have the potential engine installed because when these uh, particles enter the combustion chamber, they can melt and they can form a glass and they can clock uh, the cooling system of the airplane and produce uh, the engine stall. So this is something that we have to avoid and this one is, is one of the main reasons by which we do this uh, operational modeling of the clouds to prevent encounters with uh, aircraft. Apart from that, of course, the fallout also impacts on airports no? and disrupts the normal operation of airports because you have to clean uh, the runaways. Uh, and this is a procedure that is quite uh, expensive and time consuming. This is the picture that I took uh, in, in La Palma uh, a few days ago of the cleaning operation of, of the airport. And, and you can see that the people they have to, let's say, with machines and manually clean all every time that there is, that is fallout, you have uh, to clean it uh, to resume the operations and the normal operations of the airport. No? So this is um, what volcanic clouds are. Now question is, okay, how, how do we model that? Okay, uh, the objective as a set of modeling and, and forecasting volcanic clouds is uh, to obtain where they are or where they will be in time and space of the trajectory and how the concentration within this clouds will evolve with time. And we have many families and many types of models in general, but all of them, important point is all, all of them have uh, three components. So on one side, we need first a meteorological or anomalical weather prediction model, which essentially tells us the state of the atmosphere in the future, so this is the 4D. Uh, we need to know uh, the wind field, the pro some properties of the air, like uh, Density, viscosity, temperature, moisture. You would want if we want, for example, to include abrogation, precipitation rate uh, for wet deposition, uh, etc. So we need uh, several meteorological parameters that are furnished by uh, the meteorological models. That can be on several scales. We can have uh, global scale uh, models, but we can also have uh, regional scale uh, models. Or even if we want to do very very high uh, resolution simulations we might need uh, to use uh, some more local scale uh, meteorological model. Of course, this can be, the, 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 let's say, the typical forecast, uh, if we want to simulate what will happen in the future, or if we want to simulate what happened in the past, we can rely on uh, any of the reanalysis uh, data sets that, that exist in, in the world. <laughs> Uh, the second component is the dispersal model per se, in which uh, we model how the, the particles and eventually also the aerosols, so, so essentially the SO2, are uh, transport. And that include the different uh, physical phenomena that, that occur in transport. So that's the, uh, the effect of wind advection, the turbulent diff diffusion, the particle segmentation, that, as I said before, is very, very strongly dependent on the, on the size of the particle. So we need to parameterize how, uh, which is the settling velocity of these particles depending on the, on the properties of the particles, on, on the shape, on the size, on the density, etc. Uh, some of the models also take into account the uh, way uh, wet and dry deposition mechanisms. Uh, wet deposition, of course, it can be in cloud or below cloud. Uh, in cloud, of course, when uh, let's say we have uh, water, water uh, drops, water droplets that can coat volcanic particles and they can stick. And wet deposition is produced is uh, below cloud and it's the fact that when, the, the, when it rains, these uh, drops uh, can drag uh, the particles and can produce also uh, some 
uh, premature removal of, of, of mass in the cloud. Uh, some of the models also contemplate uh, the eventual occurrence of particle aggregation. And of course, if we have, uh, for example, SO2, we also need to add some chemical uh, model on it to account for the different chemical reactions, or even in some cases, the different phase changes that, that uh, might occur in these aerosols. And then we have a third component, which is the so-called the emission model, in which uh, we need to define how the source term is. Source term, I mean, essentially the volcanic plume. So which is the, the properties of these particles and, uh, and the mass flux, uh, the evolution of the mass flux in, in time and space. Uh, this can be an independent model or typically nowadays in most of the models, the emission model is directly embedded within the dispersal model. So that actually we just have two components, the MET model and the dispersal model that has some emission model embedded within it. Okay, uh, the important point is that this emission model is characterized by what we call the eruption source parameters. Uh, uh, we will see this in, in the next slides. Uh, of course, we have uncertainties in all the components. So we have uncertainties in maybe in the meteorological forecast. We have uncertainties in the dispersal model that, for example, might come from the different physical parameterizations that, that we have. But some of them are, are not perfect. Some of them rely on some for example, the, the sedimentation velocity uh, rely on, on, on experiments that, that uh, some, let's say, uh, analytical relationships that gave, give us the, the settling velocity, et cetera. So there are uncertainties, but by far the most uncertain part of all these uh, different components is, is the, the emission term. This is very challenging. And this is the reason, is the main reason why data assimilation is, is needed. So what, what are these eruption source parameters that we have in the emission, in the emission model? So first we have the emission term. So we have to give this model essentially the start and the end time of each of the eruptive phases. So when the eruption starts, when it ends, or if uh, the conditions of the eruption are far from steady, then they, they vary with time, we need to give a time series. And we distinguish typically different eruptive phases. So we have to know the starting and the end time of each. And the most important one is at which age do we put this material, in, in, at which atmospheric level do we inject all this material? So this is what the, the injection height of the eruption column height, okay? Then we also have to give uh, how the mass uh, distributes or is released uh, along or across the, this eruption column. And of course, the emission rate, that is the, the, the mass flux, the total mass that is uh, emitted or or that is released in the atmosphere by unit of time. If we look at the level of uncertainty, we might see that, okay, you can say that uh, the starting and the end times and the cloud height, mm, I just put it in green because they are often, I said not always, but I are often observable, observable even by just by visual observation. And uh, the vertical distribution of mass, we more or less know how, how, how it distributes, but, how it distributes in vertical based on, on what we know from past, past events. So I would say that this has a moderate level of uncertainty. In contrast, uh, the emission rate is quite uncertain. And this is very important because this is telling us uh, the amount of mass that we are releasing in the atmosphere. And at the end, this dictates which is the concentration of the cloud uh, and wind. Uh, all these models are based on the mass on the mass conservation equation, and with uh, with the exception of some some terms or some phenomena like weight deposition or aggregation, most of the processes are linked, and it means that if we double uh, uh, the mass flow rate, we double the concentration down with. If we do an error of hundred percent here, we do an error of uh, hundred percent in the in the estimation of the concentration that we more or less. Eh? I'm now assuming that everything is linear. Uh, this emission rate, uh, we know also that it depends essentially or very uh, importantly, heavily, depends heavily on, on the column height, but it's very, very difficult to uh, quantify in real time. And this is the main source of uncertainty of, of, of volcanic cloud forecast. On the other hand, apart from characterizing the emission term, we also need to characterize the properties of the particles that we are injecting in the atmosphere that we are emitting. 
and, and that includes the particle size distribution, the, and the density, and the shape factor. Okay, so at, the message is that at the time of forecasting, we can have, uh, uh, we will have always aleatoric and epistemic uh, uncertainties. Uh, one important thing is that uh, this uh, emission rate is proportional to the fourth power of the, of the injection height, of the column height. And this has implications. First of all, on, on the model errors, because even if we do small errors on, in the determination of the column height, these uh, amplify and translate in large errors in the concentration, okay? And not only, and we will see in the second part of this talk how this is important for data simulation because uh, the distribution of, of uh, the errors is not Gaussian anymore, and this will have implications. Just by now, just remember this. Okay, so there are several or many models that would say uh, that are operational in different parts of the world. Some of them are Eulerian, some models are Lagrangian. Uh, these models are used by the so-called uh, volcanic ash advisory centers and other uh, institutions at national level to, to forecast uh, volcanic clouds whenever an eruption occurs in some part of the world. And what uh, typically, uh, I would say before uh, the eruption of the El Vieja in Iceland in 2010, these forecasts were more qualitative in the sense that uh, they uh, were just interested in saying if there is ash, no ash, because uh, the mandatory regulation at that time was just to delineate zones in which there is some ash, but uh, the models didn't have to tell us uh, how much ash, just yes or not, okay? This uh, paradigm was very much criticized in 2010 uh, because of uh, all the disruption that this eruption produced in the European airspace, and uh, new guidelines were adopted based more on a quantitative uh, criteria on, on concentration threshold, and uh, for example, three levels were defined in Europe at the time based on the concentration values of 0 to 2 and 4 uh, milligrams per cubic meter. And this has important implications for operational, for operational systems, because if you have to deliver a forecast with uh, quantitative values, then we need to estimate with much, much better precision uh, the emission term. This is the main weakness that, that we had at that time. No? So the question that the scientific community posed at that time in 2010 is, oh, how can we constrain the source parameters under related uncertainties? And several strategies have been developed since then uh, the first one uh, is based on, or, or I would say, based on the use of, of ensemble runs. So, okay, we have something that is uncertain. Take, for example, the, the, uh, the eruption height. So we do an ensemble of simulations, exploring all the possible uh, parameter space. And then with that, we can do two things. We can do a deterministic forecast as we did before, but for example, taking the ensemble mean, the ensemble median or any, any combination of the ensemble members. But the advantage is that now we have uncertainty quantification metrics because for example, based on ensemble spread, uh, we can have an idea about the uncertainty of the forecast. But when we have these ensemble based runs, we can also have probabilistic forecasts, for example, by counting how many members verify a certain condition. For example, I don't know, uh, concentration value or the detection threshold or et cetera. This, let's say, has been one, one family of modeling strategies. The other one is um, data simulation, either considering in situ monitoring, monitoring uh, to quantify the source term, but this is quite difficult. This essentially means uh, putting the instrumentation at the volcano to quantify the source term in situ. Uh, this in many cases is not uh, feasible because we have uh, more than 1,000 active volcanoes worldwide. Some of them are very remote in remote places. Uh, it's logistically, it's very difficult to have all of them well monitored. So uh, it's more practical uh, to rely on digital cloud observations, or observations that are done away from the volcano, okay? And then we can also have, of course, a combination of uh, ensemble based run and data simulation, as, as we will see later on. So uh, let's spend a few slides now on the observation of, of volcanic clouds. Uh, actually, we can see volcanic clouds 
using many, many different instrumentations. Uh, for example, satellite-based sensor, we can have uh, passive monitoring or active monitoring, for example, uh, using LIDARs on board of, of satellites. But we also can see volcanic, observe volcanic clouds from ground-based ground uh, instrumentation networks. For example, what you see here on the right is uh, an image of the European Early Net uh, Network of, of LIDARs. Uh, we can use, uh, in some cases, cyclometers uh, that typically are deployed for other purposes, more for uh, the study of the, um, the planetary boundary layer, etc. So for other purposes, but that uh, in some cases can also be used to observe volcanic clouds, same as uh, the leader networks. And we also have, of course, our air quality stations. And then we can also observe or measure, let's say, uh, the concentration in volcanic clouds uh, using uh, research aircraft uh, equipped equip with, uh, for example, particle, particle counters. Of all these three options, let's say satellite-based, ground-based, or even uh, aircraft-based uh, instrumentations, the most used one by far is, is satellites uh, for several reasons, because they can give uh, much higher resolution, uh, the density, of course, is, is, is much higher. Consider that uh, satellites now give uh, kilometer size uh, in pixel, whether the, the density of a station of networks like Erlinet is, is the one that you see here. So compare, compare this, the density of this network with one, one grid at one kilometer resolution. No? But apart from that, satellites also have glo global coverage and that includes oceans, which is something we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, ground-based networks in the oceans, instead satellites can give a global a global coverage. Okay. So I would say in for operational in, in operational mode, satellite is the only one choice. But uh, the other the other two uh, data sets or the other two instrumentation types are also very useful for validation purposes. So uh, typically we use ground-based networks and if we have then data from aircraft to validate a posteriori our simulations. So one important question is how we can discriminate uh, from, from a satellite, uh, volcanic ash clouds from other meteorological clouds or other clouds, uh, for example, dust clouds or, or, or other types. No? This is a, a modest image on true color of the AFL eruption. And here we can see clearly how an ash cloud looks like in the visible. Then we have uh, lots of meteorological clouds. And then we have some parts in which it is not clear whether this is a meteorological cloud or is an ice layer. No? This is very typical. And uh, a very important step forward was done in the late 80s or during the 90s with, uh, let's say, the development of uh, ice detection techniques using satellites based on, on, on passive sensor monitoring. Uh, the idea is very, very simple. We have the Earth that is emitting in the thermal infrared. This radiation passes through an ash cloud and, or an ash cloud, a cloud that we don't, still don't know what, what, what this cloud is. But the important point is that the absorption that this, uh, that this uh, radiation, uh, the absorption of this radiation depends on the wavelengths and depends on what is in here. No? And this is then detected by, by the satellite. And there was a very important, uh, let's say seminal work uh, by, by, uh, by Prata in, in the late 90s, in which uh, the so-called reverse absorption was uh, applied to detect uh, volcanic ash. And the idea is very simple, is that uh, he realized that, that the silicate, silicate particles are more absorbent at shorter wavelengths than uh, water droplets in, in meteorological clouds. So they have an opposite behavior. So if we take, the absorption at two different wavelengths, uh, for example, 10.8 and 12. And we do the difference. In one case, this is positive. Uh, for, for, um, for volcanic ice, this difference is negative, whereas for, for meteorological clouds or water or ice clouds, this in principle should be positive. So doing this dual channel difference, in principle, we should be able to discriminate one from the other. So this is how it works. We have here a modest true color image in which we see meteorological clouds, but we also see, um, we can imagine here the, pres the presence of volcanic ice, no? 
when we do this in the thermal infrared and we take this brightness temperature difference, we get something like that. So this is what we get when we do this uh, reverse absorption mechanism. The most basic one, this is far from perfect. As you see, there is a lot of noise here. There is noise visible and in many other parts. So actually what we do is not just doing this uh, dual channel difference, but we apply many other filters. No? For example, we can correct or uh, we can put a mask for, for cloud surface, and this is, eliminates a lot of noise in this part. Uh, we can also correct for some uh, zenithal view satellite uh, projections that, that we might have, for example, in this case, that the, the image was very close to the edge of the satellite and other corrections. But the important point is that at the end, after applying all these filters, in principle, one should be able to discriminate uh, clearly and I said in principle, uh, the volcanic uh, ash from the other clouds. Okay, as we will see later, this is far from perfect, eh? but by now, let's say that we have a mechanism to uh, separate or to highlight uh, volcanic clouds and separate them from other types of clouds. But this is not a retrieval. This is just something that is telling us this detection algorithm, yes or no, there is ice and there is no ice. And we want to know also how much or how many, uh, how much ash there is in, in the cloud. And for that, we need a step further. And this step forward is, is a retrieval in which uh, we get, uh, we want to get the column mass. No? So we have to combine this detection algorithm with some more, let's say, complex uh, radio twist transfer models that can tell us uh, the properties or the, um, the effective. Uh, size of the particles in this cloud and the mass per unit area. For example, this is what uh, further step in the image that we saw before when we do uh, a retrieval and we can retrieve uh, the mass load. The mass load is the vertical integration of mass. So this is a zenithal view. And what we see here is the mass per unit area. So we are just here zooming all the vertical column in, in the atmosphere. Okay, so that's why the unit is per square meter. So we have many, many let's say sensors uh, on board of several uh, platforms. And nowadays this is just not a not exhaustive list of, of what we have, uh, several platforms carrying different types of, of sensors. And uh, we can have, uh, for example, with geostationary satellites, uh, global coverage combining uh, uh, different, different satellites. It's important to distinguish between the, the geostationary observations and those that are polar orbiting that normally give us a couple of passes uh, per day. So uh, which are the pros and the cons of uh, observing uh, volcanic clouds from satellites? The advantage is that nowadays we have this last generation of geostationary satellites that give us a high frequency, let's say image images every 10, 15 minutes typically and a very, very high spatial resolution, one, two kilometers pixel size, and they have global coverage. These are the advantages, this is clear. But this is, is far from perfect, okay, for many reasons. The first one is that uh, the ash cloud uh, can be obscured by overlying meteorological clouds. Remember that we are considering here a, a, a passive uh, sensing, so this is not active sensing, what we typically have on board of geostationary satellites. And uh, these absorption signals can be masked by the presence of ice. For example, if uh, uh, ash particles are caught by, by ice, maybe they can be hidden and we can have, uh, we cannot detect them. So we, we see areas of the cloud that, that, uh, that are undetected by the, by the satellites. No? These detection algorithms also can fail in detecting ash clouds that are um, optically thick, okay? And then another, another just thing which I want to draw your attention is that even if everything goes very, very well, we always have with the satellites a 2D view, it's a zenithal view. So we don't have any, with the passive sensors, we don't have any vertically resolved information of the cloud. So we don't know the, the cloud thickness and we don't know the concentration. It means that if we use this type of observations, we need to do some additional assumptions, for example, about the thickness of the cloud to infer uh, uh, the concentration, for example. Uh, so this uh, retrieval gives us the mass per unit area, and we need to assume uh, a cloud thickness or to collocate these observations with, with some other observations in order to have 
3D picture of, of this cloud, okay? This is how collocation looks like. You see here, for example, two, uh, two retrievals uh, from this cloud in, you know, in, in on Colon Cauje Volcano. And what we get from the satellite, geostationary satellite are these uh, ash mass loadings, okay? But as I said, this is a 2D image of the cloud, but we can co-locate them with uh, other observations. For example, we had here the pass of one uh, polar orbiting satellite. And what you see here, the green line uh, is, is uh, this image. So when we combine both uh, geostationary and polar orbiting observation, we can really get, is the only way to get this really 3D structure of the cloud. And we can have an idea here about the cloud thickness and the, the average concentration within the cloud. Similar situation for SO2. Uh, the only thing is that SO2 is actually more easy to observe than the volcanic ash, uh, but there are also some, let's say some, some problems sometimes with the detection and retrieval loss of SO2. Uh, I think I'll leave, leave it here. Maybe we can take a, a, a five or 10 minutes break and then we will go straight to the data simulation. Yes, you are correct. Yeah, we will take a 10 minutes at the, in the program and we will reconvene at 9.55. Okay. Uh, very bad. By the way, you can look in the chat. There is a, there are a few questions, but you don't need to answer immediately. Uh, but uh, uh, during the time, question and answer, uh, mm -hmm. you may uh, wish to answer this question. Okay, yeah. So mm, there, there is time. No, if I do another 40, 45 minutes, then then. then yes. We'll after that, we will have minutes. some 20, 15 minutes for questions and answers. Well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, now it's a break. Yeah, enjoy the break. <laughs>